foretaste of things to come. Good morning, Hampton Park. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to see you this morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to uh, those of you watching from home or where it is you are today. Uh, I hope that you are ready to worship, that you have your hearts and your minds prepared, and that things are kind of uh, taken out of your, your mind and your head, and you're focusing on being in this time and in this place and allowing God to speak to you on this uh, beautiful Sabbath day morning. Uh, on the back is the uh, September newsletter, <laughs> the half sheet of paper with just a couple of September dates on it. You'll want to grab that. That's out there by the communion cups if you don't have it already. Uh, just a couple of uh, things happening. Um, I am going to take uh, next Sunday off my last one for the year, I promise. Well, I can't <laughs> promise that, but uh, the one that I chose anyway. Um, and Michelle, Michelle Thielen will give the message. Michelle is the uh, chairperson of the board here at St. James. And so she has a couple of things that she'd like to share and some things going on in her head about some collaboration uh, ideas with us and St. James. And she's willing to bring the message next week, so uh, look forward to that. And the rest of the things you can uh, read for yourself, those are on there. For now, we turn our thoughts and our attentions on being in the sanctuary for this time of worship, on being uh, focused in from, from uh, other places, focus in on this time of worship. Know that God is present and real and relevant to your life today. What gifts does God give you to use? And how do you use those gifts effectively for the benefit of others? So stay tuned. But for now, I invite you to stand if you're able and join in the call to worship that's printed on the screen, followed by our opening hymn, Standing on the Promises. Let's stand together. Come, sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers and aunts. Come, come grandmas, grandmas and grandpas, grandpas uncles and nephews, nephews nieces, nieces and neighbors and, and friends. Christ calls us together as parts of one body for worship and service and praise. Let's, Let's worship, worship God, God together. together, standing on the front. <coughs>
pop a minute? Hey, Eli. So how did it go last week? <laughs> That's a great <laughs> word. <laughs> a great word. That's sort of a non-committal sort of <laughs> like I'm still processing. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. So I, I have a picture. I'm going to show these guys first. Let's see if I get it upside down, right side up, <laughs> right side up. Okay. Show it to the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many of you have seen what's in this picture? Everybody? Oh, that one. Here. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Got it? How many of you have seen that what's in this picture? Let me see it again. Everybody? Okay. How about you guys? Have you seen what's in this picture? So, geese flying in formation. Do you ever think much about this when you see this happening? Yeah. I mean, like, that's cool, or not, or, nah, don't give it much thought. I'm going to tell you something. This is one of the greatest feats. Not F E E T S, but F E A T S. This is one of the most amazing things in nature. Is geese flying in formation? So I'm going to tell you about that. So there's a phrase out there. When you do something, someone will call you a silly goose. <laughs> All you silly goose, right? Silly goose. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know where that phrase came from. If any of you know. You can share it, but that's about the farthest thing from the truth. <laughs> Honestly, if you think about that, I want to tell you a little bit about them, okay? They fly in this V formation, okay? Which is pretty amazing. So, here we go. Recent scientific studies. Now, I don't know who studies this or how, but this is what it says. Recent scientific studies has shown that as each goose flaps its wings, it gives just a little bit of lift of the air to the one behind it. So it has been determined that flying this way gives the geese about 70% more flying range, which means they can fly 70% farther if they fly in formation because they're on the air of the one in front of them, okay? So, of course, this means that the one at the beginning of the V is working the hardest, right? Okay? So, but when that goose gets tired, that goose falls back to the end of the formation and another one takes its place. Now, that's team. Yeah. Yeah. And you will also notice that as geese are flying in this formation, they're usually honking, right? You've heard of that noise of that honking flock of geese flying over. They honk like this to encourage each other. True. It's always easier to do something difficult when you have encouragers. And they do this to encourage each other to keep flying. Sometimes a goose becomes sick or injured and falls to the ground. When this happens, two of the geese go down and stay with it until it is well. If it dies, they join another formation and continue on their journey. Did you know that? Does that sound silly? 
Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. It sounds to me like they're pretty smart. So, what lessons do you think we can learn from geese? The scripture lesson that we're talking about this morning is, is one towards the back of the book where the writer says, you know, we all have different gifts and talents and things that we can use, that God gives us to use. We're not all given the same thing. What could we learn from these geese? What do you all think? Help each other, encourage each other. Teamwork, absolutely. Encourage each other. It's important that we all learn how to honk. <laughs> I think that would be cool. If we're all doing something, like when Fred gets done with his prelude, instead of clapping, we all honk. That would be awesome. <laughs> To encourage one another. We also learn that it's important to look after each other when somebody's sick or not feeling well, or down, or discouraged. We also learn that it's important that teamwork, it's important to share responsibilities so that not one person carries the weight. I think you can learn a lot. I hope that as you grow and you learn more about God in your life, that you realize some of the gifts that God's given to you. And they're not talents. Not I don't mean like what you're good at. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I don't mean like what you're good at. But I mean like what gifts have God given to you that you can use to encourage somebody else. Because that's what we're here for. And that's what the world needs. Way more encouragers. For sure. So maybe you can honk like inside. I don't know that I'd honk outside. She's good, isn't she? <laughs> but keeping in mind to honk, to encourage people to, to use your gift as God intends. Okay, all right, let's pray about that. Dear God, I thank you for Eli and Ari. Just as they're growing, they're learning about life and about. Uh, how to treat each other and how to walk on this uh, on the way. So I pray for them that you'll help them to realize the gifts that you've given to them and how they might be able to use those gifts to encourage others. And we pray that for all of us too. Keep in mind our gifts and use it for the betterment of others. We pray in your name. All right. Thanks, guys. As we come to God in prayer, we're going to be thinking about some of those things. This is a responsive prayer. We'll get it in your head when I say, gracious God, hear our prayer. Your response is, and in your love, answer. Try that. And in, in your, your love, love answer. answer. Gracious God, hear our prayer. And, and in your love, answer. answer. Let's pray. Gracious God, in love you created us, and in love you sustain us day after day after day. So, it is with confidence today that we bring our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and that you will answer. Today we offer our prayers for the world around us. We pray for those who find themselves in some kind of chains for those who are forced into slavery or persecution, for those who are oppressed by governments or economic systems, for those <clears throat> enslaved by personal addictions, for those conquering battles like depression and sadness. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love, answer. We pray today for those who struggle to raise their children in the midst of violence or poverty. 
those who can only stand by and watch as their sons and daughters die of starvation, of preventable disease, from violence in the streets. Gracious God, hear our prayer and in your love answer. We pray for those who refuse to participate in violence or injustice, for those who courageously stand up for what they know is right, regardless of the personal consequences. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. We also pray today, as hard as it is, we pray for those who are hurtful to others, those who are unable to break free from cycles of violence and anger. We pray for those who have lost empathy and compassion. We pray for those who have lost tempers and the ability to think clearly. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. And we pray for all those who struggle this day, whether physically, emotionally, or spiritually. May your presence surround and sustain each one. May it sustain us. Gracious God, hear our prayer, and in your love, answer. And finally, God, we pray for ourselves, members of your body here on earth. Break down the barriers that divide us from one another. Unite us in our common allegiance to you as Lord and Savior, God, increase our compassion and our humility in our relationships and release the gifts that you have given to each one so that in us and through us, your kingdom might come and your will will be done here on earth, just like it will be in heaven. Hear us as we pray this prayer on the Sabbath day and also as we pray the prayer that your son taught us as we pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> So, we're ready to study the word for today. And the word for today comes out of the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Paul's writing this letter to the church in Rome. And we're going to start with chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> And it goes like this. He writes like this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind God will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and the customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And Paul says, because of the privilege and authority that God has given to me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given to us. 
Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In God's grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, then be encouraging. If it is giving, then give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Oh, they had to add gladly on the end of there, didn't they? Romans 12, 1 through 8. What a gorgeous passage of scripture, right? Whatever you feel about Paul and how his writings and all of that, this is an amazing passage of scripture. So he uses this image. And that's how Paul writes, because he is a master of imagery. He uses them a lot in his writings in the New Testament. Sometimes rapidly jumping from one image to another, like in 1 Thessalonians 5, the thief will come in the night. The woman will go into labor. You mustn't get drunk, but stay awake and put on the whole armor of God. He uses these images to get his point across. And he keeps jumping back to this image of us as the body of Christ. And even, and even in the body of Christ, he refers to different things. Like, the body is a jar of clay. The body is a tent. The body is a building. The body is clothing, each with a slightly different twist. One of the images that we're looking at today in this passage is this image of the human body. Specifically, the church or the group of believers as the body of Christ. But in some ways, I think he's trying to describe this as more of a reality, and it really is more of a reality than it is just an image. But it's one we can grab onto and understand. It's an image and it's a metaphor, and he uses it for a particular purpose. He uses it to teach the early Christians, the early churches, how to be united even though they're different, even though they have different parts and functions. How an individual's uniqueness has a part to play in not only the work of the church, but the kingdom outside of it, right? How no one gets to take pride in their positions because we all belong to each other. We all fly in formation. Americans spend, I don't get half the figure, but Americans spend in the millions of dollars, I'm gonna say probably even more than that, trying to make their bodies beautiful. <laughs> and if they can't make them beautiful, at least they're gonna spend a lot of money trying to make them presentable. Now, Paul suggests that we present our bodies as living sacrifices. When you make a sacrifice of something, Paul says our bodies are a living sacrifice to God. What makes our bodies presentable is not our appearance, but the end towards which these bodies are dedicated. The end, the purpose that these bodies have. Paul basically says that if our bodies are truly dedicated to God, they are not only presentable, but they are beautiful. 
So, here we are, this image of the body of Christ. An example of how we use the gifts that God has already given to us to bring others along on this crazy journey of following Christ. So Paul says that we're all parts of this body, each one of you with different gifts to share. And then basically he says that if God gives you that gifts, then by golly, you got to go use it. You don't have a choice. If you have the gift of X, then go do it. He gives you that list. If you have the gift of, of A, then go use it. Go do it. Go. If you're the gift is kindness, be kind. Find your gift and use it. It's what that's saying. Maybe you've already tried. Maybe you thought you had a gift. This is me. Maybe you thought you had a gift in something, but it never really panned out. <laughs> or maybe the opposite is true. Maybe you didn't think you had a gift for anything, but then you learned that you actually do. But here's the thing. This is hard. This is hard. Paul is difficult. Here's the thing. Finding our gifts is not, hear me, not, I have that underlined and bold in my notes, not a matter of trial and error. I'm going to try this if it works out. I'm going to try that if it works. Finding the gift that God has given you is not about that. Finding the gift that God has given you is a matter of listening to God and where God might be calling you. That might be totally different from something you want to try out or from a talent that you have. Where is God calling you? It's different than a talent. It's not the same thing at all. It's following a calling, listening for God. I did a spiritual gifts assessment on myself not long ago because I had to give a, a keynote address to our advanced conference. Remember that day I went down there? And it was using your spiritual gifts in relationships. That was my theme, what I was talking on. So I did a spiritual gifts assessment on myself. My spiritual gift? Exhortation. <laughs> Big surprise there, right? I can talk to anybody about anything, doesn't matter. <laughs> But I would not have said, that's my talent, or that's what I'm good at. But it's the gift that God has given to me. It's following the calling from God. So how can I use that gift in the body of Christ? Now, I get that you might not have a real clear picture of what your spiritual gift is. You can go online and do a spiritual gifts assessment easy, free, find out what it is. But you might not have an idea of what your spiritual gift is. Or at least not when it comes to being a part of the body of Christ. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have a gift for you. <laughs> That's not how the love of God works. So if you're feeling like you don't really know what your spiritual gift is, ask God. And then listen for the answer. Ask God to shape you. That's what a potter does. If there is something in your life that, I'm going to use scriptural language here, something in your life that's unclean or decaying or wasting away, ask God to prune you. It's what a gardener does. If you're afraid you lack skills and direction, ask God to guide you. That's what the head of the body does. And who is the head of the body, scripture says? Christ. And you may find that what you thought was an issue, God doesn't see as an issue. And you may find that something you didn't think was an issue was maybe something that God wants you to work on. But everybody has a unique part to play. There's this story in Luke chapter 5 about how the disciples had been fishing all night, they didn't catch anything, and Jesus comes walking along, he's like, hey, throw your net out the other side, and so they do. And they bring in this big net full, you know. Sometimes you and I have to throw our net in another direction if we need to know what we're to do. I can assure you, you have gifts you don't even know you have yet. So where does the world need your gifts? That's the question. 
Where does the world need your joys? Where does the world need your interests? Where does the world need your spiritual gift? I'll never forget ever this woman in Lexington, Kentucky when I was in seminary. And she was the night manager at the Kinko's Copies. I don't even think there is a Kinko's Copies anymore, but just down from the seminary, there was a Kinko's Copy open 24 hours a day right across from the University of Kentucky. And she was a, a teacher at the local community college who gave up that job to become the night manager at Kinko's Copies on the University of Kentucky campus. Why? Why? And she said it was her favorite job ever. I'll never forget her. She had the time and the patience to be very helpful to customers in need. Customers like me, who came in feeling panicked in the middle of the night on Saturday because I got to get my bulletins printed for Sunday morning and I was just getting them finished. She liked that she could actually help someone who needed it. And it is a vocation as Christians to share the love of Christ, to be a catalyst for Christ's love in the world, whatever your gift should be. I've heard it a million times. I'm too old, yada, yada, yada. I'm too tired. I've done my share. Let someone else do it. That's not my strength. I'm not comfortable with that. I've heard it a thousand times. But that's not the question. The question is, are you using your God-given gifts as God intends? Or are you using your God-given gifts to make a difference in someone's life? Because that's the commission. So what sparks your interest? What do you think God is calling you to be and to do at this stage in your life? And nothing is not the answer. <laughs> what do you want to take to God for God to develop and nurture and grow so that you can be all you can be? And now is the perfect time to live into that gift. I'm telling you, you know it. The world needs the body of Christ now more than ever before. So, what is one way that you can use what God has given you to make a difference? For the sake of time, I won't make you answer these questions out loud. <laughs> what is one way that you can use what God has given you to make a difference? How can you use the spiritual God gift that God has given you right now in this moment? Now more than ever, man, if we have a gift, we need to be using it. Now more than ever, if you have the gift of compassion, you need to use it. Now more than ever, if you have that gift of kindness, you need to use it. The church and the world needs all of us flying in formation, using the gifts to make the body of Christ come to life and to make a difference for God wherever we go. Let's pray about that. God, we come into your presence today just <coughs> thinking about what gifts have you given to us? What, what are ways that we can use a gift from you to bring about unity in the body of Christ? Push us this week, God, to think about those things, to think about what our gifts are, not what our talents are, not what we're comfortable with, but what gift you have given to us to bring together the body of Christ. Help us as we springboard into those week, into this week with those thoughts. We pray in your name. Amen. So we springboard into that scripture into our time of communion. So we come to the table. Just like we do every week as disciples. And we thank God for his sending his son Jesus, and we, we're reminded that Jesus gave up his life. And all of those things that we do every week, every time we gather. But today in your prayer time, I ask that you pray to God to show you what your gift is. Not your talent, but your God-given gift that you can use as you would for God. So come to this table open and listening 
Prepare to be renewed and strengthened by your time at this table and by this meal. Let's come to the table. Our communion hymn is called Be Known to Us in Breaking Bread. <laughs> the time of worship where we unite as one to remember what Christ has done for us. All are welcome to join in communion because this is the Lord's table and we are here at his invitation. Please join me in prayer. Precious Lord, provider of our every need, we come to you this morning in awe of the blessings you have put in our lives. Help us to be open to your guidance, your teachings, and the occasional push, even when it may not be in a direction that's not in our comfort zone. For you are always with us, wherever we go, whatever journey or path you put us on. Thank you also for the opportunity to break bread together every week as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Help us remember what this bread represents, your broken body on the cross so that we could have eternal life with our Heavenly Father. As we partake of the cup this morning representing your blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, we marvel at the depth of your love for us. What an awesome gift we've been given. Help us share that love with others as Jesus did. As we leave here this week, may we each find the inner peace that only your spirit and presence in our lives can bring. Help us remember that we are to be Jesus' disciples in today's world. We are his hands and feet. May he watch over us and bring us back together next week into this loving faith community. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread blessed it and said to his disciples, this represents my broken body. Take and as often as you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us share in the bread together. Jesus, in the same way, lifted the cup, blessed it, and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood.
for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, and every time you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Let us share in the cup together. God's house today, worshiping. I hope that from wherever you are, you have found God's presence real in your life today. Uh, we will sing our closing song, I'll Fly Away, one of our favorites, followed by the benediction. I will let you know uh, that I am on call for work for hospice this weekend, and I did get a call out, so I'm going to skedaddle, and Patty's going to lead you in your closing prayer, so uh, I have to, to take off, but please be in prayer for one of my patients, very young, 60s, early 60s, uh, passing away today from uh, intestinal cancer of some kind, so uh, a lot of stuff out there, so I do invite you to stand, let's sing our closing song, followed by our benediction. <laughs>
joy and confidence to love and serve the Lord. For the blessing of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit goes with you. Amen. Amen. Amen.